Last month was one of the saddest programs imaginable. And yet there are some really positive outcomes. There have been three arrests and two convictions, both involving some of the most prolific criminals in recent times. Ironically, one of the cases where there's not been a result so far is the one that's so close to our own hearts, the murder of Jill Dando. But I'll tell you more about that in a moment. First, this letter. It's uh, from a senior detective in Essex, thanking viewers without whose help, he says, one of Britain's worst offenders might never have been caught. Last December, we reconstructed a series of attacks that police feared could be the work of the most prolific rapist in modern criminal history. The resulting conviction at the Old Bailey dominated the news. Clues from our reconstruction were recognized by a member of the rapist's family, and an operation to arrest the suspect was organized from a back room here in the Crime Watch studio. Early the following morning, as he was about to leave for Spain, 35-year-old disc jockey Richard Baker was arrested at Heathrow. One sad postscript is that his brother, whose tip-off led to the arrest, has been ostracized by some members of his family. But if he hadn't acted as he did, there could have been dozens, even hundreds of other victims. Senior detectives have asked us to thank him and everyone who called. Now, news on the murder of Jill Dando. I must confess I was pessimistic after last month's program, but DCI Hamish Campbell, the officer in charge, is adamant the crime will be detected. His team is doing the hard slog now of checking literally thousands of clues, and it may take several months before the crime is solved, but he says it will be solved. Meanwhile, he repeats his offer of anonymity and a reward of up to £150,000 for background on the gun that killed Jill or any other information that leads to the conviction of her killer. Call Crime Stoppers if you want on 0800 555 one. You can call them anonymously, 0800 555 one. For a year and a half, there has been an epidemic of an un-British sort of crime, behaviour we normally associate with lawless countries where bandits are at large. Here, it seems to be confined to one gang and to an area of northwest England. There have so far been at least 20 attacks, and probably many more. Four forces, Merseyside, Cheshire, Lancashire and Greater Manchester, have now combined their effort to catch a group of thugs who've been robbing family in their homes. And one of the unusual features is that they're content to carry out these attacks even when there are children in the house. Hello? Is this 27? It's next door. That way. The neighbours don't recall having any visitors that afternoon. But everyone in the Northwest remembers the next day, the night of Manchester United's last-minute victory in the European Cup. United fans will ask, where did you watch the 1999? For a family of five in Hale in Manchester, it was a night they can never forget. Dodo was barking outside and I went outside to see who was barking at. And I thought it was a fox. And then I saw a figure. I thought it was the boy next door who usually plays jokes and pranks on us. Go! 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 Get on the floor! Do as he says! Get down now! All right, who else is in the house? Hey, kid, I said, who else is in the house? My sister. She's asleep upstairs. Please leave her. Don't look at us. Get on the floor, I said! Keep still! The man who tied us up sounded black because his voice was richer. Give me your hands, boy. Imagine if Lenny Hendry was a scouser. It sounded like that. Well, it was... It just felt as though it was surreal. I mean, it just, just wasn't happening at all. I wasn't bothered about what they took. They could, they could take at all. It was just the children I was worried about. Bracelets. The gang have tied up children as young as seven. There are common clues despite the masks. The accents are always scouse. The rings as well. Watch. Give me the watch. There are several in the gang, from three to five on any particular attack. Give me hands. 
The big one who was giving me instructions was quite close to me and I got this dreadful smell of smoke from his clothes and, and when he spoke, I mean, he was obviously a very heavy smoker. They took anything of value, often ransacking the homes for cash or jewellery, birth certificates, adoption papers, driving licences and passports. Hands. Put your hands there. It's okay. Put them over here for you. I want to know where the cash is. Where's the safe? Tell me where the safe ah. is. Ah. They always asked for the safe, even if there wasn't one. Outside. Get out here, you nuns. See that? I'm going to stick that right through your head unless you tell me where the keys to the safe are. Okay? Don't worry, we'll be where out of here soon. The one who stayed with us wasn't as nasty. Who won the match? Where are they? We did. I want to stove your head in. But he was a lot gentler and he, he was a lot nicer. Close game, was it? And I think he had blue eyes because he had like very fair. Scored the goals? Very fast stain around his eyes and it, they look blue. At least you won the treble, eh? These vivid blue eyes were seen at other attacks. And four months ago, this time in an affluent area of Liverpool, one of the attackers actually took off his mask. While a 15-year-old and a father were tied up by men wearing balaclavas, their mother upstairs got a look at one of the offenders. Well, he didn't seem to care that I was watching him. And I thought that was very peculiar because, you know, I got a good look at him and he was stocky and short and he had quite a round face. Sometimes there's been real violence. In one of the attacks just before Christmas, a woman was almost strangled. Give me the rings! Get in here. And though they usually use screwdrivers to threaten families, in two attacks, they've used a gun. The safe. <laughs> Tell me where it is. Tell me where the safe is. I thought this kind of thing happened in banks and shops, and it was the least thing I'd expected. I didn't expect four big men to come in and tie us all up. Where are the keys to the car? The gang seems to have recruited different people for different attacks, but there are so many common features, the culprits are clearly linked. And it's not just their accents that point towards Liverpool. They often steal the family's cars. And once they were chased by the police as they raced from a raid and abandoned the vehicle in Toxteth. Chile, one can only imagine the effect this has had on the families. This has been devastating for some of the families to the point where some of them have actually moved out of their homes and will not return to them. Um, you know, it's their home and it's a place where they should feel safe and that hasn't been the case. And what about the children? The children have been very brave, but who knows what the long-term effects of, of being put through something like that. In a lot of occasions, they were sitting in the lounge watching television with their parents, doing something normal in the safety of their home. When masked men have come in, some of them actually thought that it was their friends or relatives having a laugh, but it, but it wasn't. It was something real that they really didn't expect. Most Crime Watch viewers aren't going to be able to help with this, really. I mean, it's not more witnesses you, you want. Who can help and how? I think that there's somebody or, or more than someone that is out there who actually knows the people that are involved. They may know that these people are involved in crime and involved in burglaries. What they may not know is the extent of those burglaries, how bad they actually are and what they've put these people through. Some of them elderly people and some of them very young children. How much of the property that's been stolen is traceable? Some of it is, some of it isn't. We've actually got some here tonight. There's one of the items is a platinum wedding ring and that was stolen from one of the um, houses and it had engraved inside forever in my heart. Now that was actually one of the lady's late husband's wedding rings. So it's more of sentimental value it is than sentimental anything else? sentimental value, value, yes. And, and you've brought a picture in of a, of a watch. Yes, the watch is a Jaeger LeCoultre Reverso watch and that actually has engraved on the back SBA. Now there's a reward, I gather, that's for return of property or recovery of property? It is. There's a reward of up to £70,000, but that is for the return of property. So we are looking for property to be returned. OK. These have been uh, really terrible attacks. Holding a screwdriver to a father's throat and threatening to kill him in front of his children is unacceptable in a civilised society. Stop it from happening again, please. If you know anything about who's been responsible for this, 
this is the time to call 0500 600 600. If you prefer, you can call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 1. Anonymously there if you want, 0800 555 1. The incident room direct is on 0151 777 5468. That's Liverpool 777 5468. Now to an old people's home in Leamington Spa. Two men say they need access to repair some windows, then callously steal £90 from the woman's flat. The victim was 88, suffers from angina and breathing problems. Not surprisingly, the experience has left her terribly distressed. Who in the community could shelter these two? This was Leamington Spa early last month. 0500 600 600 or 01926 415 747. That's the local police on Warwick 415 747. Next, a vicious attack three months ago in Brixton, South London. A would-be robber who assaults shop staff but is eventually fought off. Here he is entering a newsagent pretending he's concealing a weapon. He starts shouting and hitting people while a member of staff runs for help. When he comes back, he starts pelting him with bottles to try to stop him hurting other people. At last, the robber runs out empty-handed. Who is he? He's obviously a menace who will attack people indiscriminately. 0500 600 600 or 0181 649 2047. That's 0181 649 2047. Last month, we showed an armed robbery in Leicester. As a direct result of calls, police now think this offence may be linked to many others. They say they have a series of new leads and they've launched a big inquiry across two forces. Police are now keen to find and eliminate three motorbikes they've been unable to trace after the hit and run in North London that killed grandmother Maria Busandri. The three bikes are all Honda Farblades. Please take down the numbers. They're 604YOW, R36YVW and R887VYB. If you own one or know where any of them are, please give us a call 0500 600 600. If you're a dealer or know anyone who's got a Honda Fabla, uh, remember these numbers please. R36YVW, R887VYB, R604YOW. Now, please think back to Monday the 3rd that's the, of May. That's the first of the May bank holidays. That Monday was memorably hot. It was gloriously sunny. Were you in Caversham near Reading in Berkshire? Or do you know anyone who was visiting there? Especially anyone who might have been camping in Blackhouse Wood near Clayfield Cots at Emma Green. Two girls aged 13 and 14 were work, walking there that afternoon. Their mothers take up the story. That he had a knife, the fact that he had a stocking over his head and was very, very menacing and totally terrified them. That's when it really sunk in and the fact that it was broad daylight, it must have just been their worst nightmare. They were just taking the dog out for a walk on that particular sunny Maybank holiday. Everyone was out and about, and it was a nice, hot, sunny day, and felt just at ease. I couldn't believe that this had happened to our daughter. I just felt, I felt angry. I felt so many mixed emotions. It was, it's, it's difficult to describe. I just wanted to hold her and reassure her that everything would be all right. The girls went there regularly and um, up until now the area was considered a very safe place for the children to play and because the gardens on the village are fairly small, most people considered the cops and the area around it to be an extension of their back garden. Mid-morning that bank holiday Monday, a woman saw a stranger in the recreation park. 
I suppose you remember things that are out of the ordinary. He just looked odd. He was around 30 and had dark collar length hair and stubble on his face. He looked, well, grubby and un untidy. Eleven AM and this man needs to be eliminated from the inquiry. Woo! Were you in Clayfield Cops Recreation Ground? Two hundred yards away is an area called Black House Wood, where the girls went on their walk. I didn't even attempt it. it took me ages and it was so boring. Come on, Jack! You have got to hear this. This reminds me of what Tommy told me. Which Tommy? My cousin, listen, it's his ghost story, yeah? The girls have always been very close. They went to primary school together from the time they were four years of age. And although they share very many mutual friends, they have a special relationship. So they've always been best friends. Could this have been you that Monday lunchtime cycling shirtless through the four fields? Well, he really likes you. No, oh, he's such a pain. Well, what about the other one? Don't you like him? Oh, he's so Jack. immature. And he really bugs me, do you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Shut the dog up. The two girls were tied up with plastic bindings. There was no attempt at rape, but they were both sexually assaulted. This is the very worst thing that could happen in any young girl's life. They're just beginning to think about boys and you know, take an interest in the opposite sex, and something like this can leave a marked effect. Obviously, the long-term implications of it perhaps haven't been realized yet. I know a lot of people who won't go across the fields. That's not going to change until we find this man. He's out there somewhere waiting to attack again. Tom, how have the girls recovered from this? They're coping very well with the ordeal. And they're being very brave. And the local community have chipped in to help by sending them flowers and chocolates. They describe the attacker as smelly dirty, unkempt, unshaven. Is this a guy who's, who's sleeping rough, maybe? Yes, we believe so. There is, um, we found two camps in the local area of Black House Woods, uh, which we want to establish who was camping there around about the time of the incident. Now, if somebody recognizes that tent or this sleeping bag, which, is that a sleeping bag? Looks like it. What is it underneath that? Yes, that's a sleeping bag underneath are they, that. Were they together or are these No, there's two separate camps. There's one, there's a tent and a sleeping bag, and another one, there's a sleeping bag on its own. Now, if someone abandoned those there, either well, doesn't want them back or doesn't want to get involved in this, why should they ring? Well, don't be afraid. Come forward and tell us if they're yours. You can have them back. It's just that we need to get them from, from our inquiries, save a lot of man hours. Now, something else you've really got to eliminate, of course, is the man seen by the witness who compiled the EFIT. You're very confident of these, this EFIT, and of course, this man either needs to be eliminated or put into the frame. That's correct, yes. We believe he's about five foot six, sorry, five foot ten to six foot tall, white male. Um, he's medium build and very unkempt and scruffy. He speaks with a northern accent and about the time he was believed to be in possession of a, what they call a sit up and beg uh, push bike. Oh, sort of old fashioned yes. push bike. With a basket on. Yeah. With a basket on the front? Yeah. Well, back? we think the basket was on the back. So this guy with his bike could be near somebody's house tonight, maybe they noticed him this afternoon, not necessarily in this Caversham area. That's correct, yes. If anybody has seen this particular man or has witnessed or been involved in any sort of incident similar to this, we'd like to know just to try and find out who this man is. When you say similar incident previous to this, you're suggesting that 
other girls may have been approached by him in the past, that this probably wasn't unprecedented as far as he was concerned. No, if you think of the attack, he actually went to those woods prepared with a mask, uh, ties for the girls, a knife. To go to that sort of extent, we believe that he's possibly done this offence before. Okay, please call 0500 600 600 if you've got any clues to add, and especially if you two have then have been approached, as Tom suggested, by a man of similar description. Ring two, of course, if you're a police or prison officer, you think you recognize the offender. And the incident room number is 01 189 181 752. That's Reading 181 752. Who's this? In a jeweler's in Surbiton three months ago. He asked to see some rings, ran out with a tray, and is captured only in the reflection of the shop mirror. It's a good picture. He's slim, about 20, around 5 foot 8, with slightly hollowed cheeks. In March, he had that closely cropped hair. 0500, 600, 600, or you can ring the local police on 0181 247 4968. That's 0181 247 4968. Next, we need your help on a murder in Northern Ireland. Bally Kelly is a garrison town not far from Londonderry. And if you know it, or anyone who was there two months ago, perhaps you can shed some light on why a local lad was murdered. Jonathan Cairns was known to his friends as Johnny Bapp. One Saturday night, he went out on the town and never came home. His family have been left devastated. I didn't realise what was going on. Must have been shock or something to go red and John's a good and quiet son. Outside the gate they've probably done the same as all the other young fellas done. You know, enjoyed himself and he's a pleasant young fellow. Always smiling. Did you see Jonathan that Saturday night, the twenty fourth of April? Who was he with? Who did he meet? Who had something against him or have you heard anybody talking about an attack on him? And I spent all night. Well, all night coming back and forth to see if his blinds were pulled in his bedroom. And when they weren't pulled, I just kept on driving and looking all around anywhere and just kept searching till six o'clock. And I'm saying, come through the valley, oh God, let him come out of somewhere. And I started crying, I come home and I said, he'll have to come home, to, he'll have to. I have to come home and out and meet me for I can't find him. Later that morning, Jonathan's blood-stained clothes were discovered in a school playground just a hundred yards from his home. His body was found in a shallow grave in these woods five miles away. You have questions you want answers to and you can't seem to go on till you get the answers. It's an absolutely terrible crime. Detective Superintendent Cole Stewart, who do you want to hear from? I want to hear from anyone who was in the village of Ballykelly or who passed through the village between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. on the 25th of April last. I also want to hear from anyone who may have been in the village and I'm thinking here of military families who have been there and have moved back to the British mainland. Uh, if anyone knows anything, I would like them to get in touch with us. I think there was somebody particularly at the junction that you were interested in tracing. That's right, David. There were a number of people seen acting suspiciously in and around the junction of the Lochamore Road and the Londonderry Road at the material time. We are very keen to trace those people, to speak with them, and where appropriate, eliminate them from our inquiries. Jonathan's body had to be moved quite a distance. How do you think that was done? I know that it was moved uh, and transported in a vehicle of some sort. And I would appeal to anyone who was on the road that leads from Ballykelly to Lochamore Forest, or indeed who was in and around Lochamore Forest itself, and who saw any vehicle, whether it was suspicious or otherwise, to contact the detectives investigating this terrible crime. Okay. If you've heard anything, you can call us here on 0500 600 600, or the incident room on 01504 379902. That's Derry 379902. Next, look at this man. Recognise him? These are very good images, though not quite so clear of his companion. Both men were spotted two months ago at an industrial estate in Kidderminster, which has had more than its fair share of bad luck. 
29 burglaries this year alone and counting, but maybe you can help put a stop to it. 0500 600 600 here, or 01527 586 That's Kidderminster, 586 We've got quite an interesting call on the uh, attack on the girls at Caversham in... Uh, in Berkshire. And we've had really a vast number of calls uh, we, and they're still coming in, in in huge volume on the house attacks in the northwest of England. Several people have been uh, saying there have been similar attacks elsewhere. Several people, we've now got probably 15, 20 names have come in. Several have been linked to the Toxteth area and I think there are going to be some serious inquiries carried out on some of these in the next uh, few minutes. Anyway, calls are still coming in. I'll tell you more about them later. For over two years, this man had been terrorising staff in building societies across northern and central England and North Wales. He changed his headgear after at first we'd called him the flat cap robber. A huge police inquiry named Operation Tornado linked dozens of attacks, but one escaped attention to last summer. After our appeal in July, a building society cashier rang the Crime Watch studio to say she was convinced a robbery at her branch was also down to the same man. Police rechecked the crime and it provided a crucial lead. The offender had escaped in a white Ford Sierra. That, together with this famous cardboard cutout, eventually led to Christopher Frank Wood, who's been sentenced to 14 years for 64 offences. And though only as an indirect result of calls to Crime Watch, Craig William Townend and William Spence have been charged in connection with an armed robbery at the York Art Gallery. All 20 stolen paintings have been recovered, and luckily they aren't as badly damaged as had been feared. We've got three new unconnected robbers that maybe we can also help to find now. Between them, these three have held up at least 25 banks and building societies. To help fix them in your mind, we're giving them names. First one is called Where's Wally, a title given him by the investigating officers. Then there's the polite Cheshire Raider, and for reasons you've just seen, and we'll see again in a moment, the cutout gunman. Where's Wally is the hero of a popular children's book, but he has a very unheroic lookalike in a gunman who so far raided seven banks and building societies, all in the West Midlands. He struck in Dudley, in the Maypole area of Birmingham, and then two days before the New Year, in Walsall. Wonder if you could help me? Yes, how can I help? Could you empty the tills with cash? He had a West Midlands accent. This is some kind of joke. No, it isn't. Just empty the cash and don't push any buttons. All the attacks are in the late afternoon, just before closing time. So who do you know who looks haggard, is about average height, has a black country accent, and isn't always around between 4 and 5 p.m. Give me the money! I haven't even got much in my till. Just give me what's there and hurry up. He seems to need, on average, 250 pounds a day. Is this for drugs? Does he gamble? Is he paying someone off? In early January, he was caught on camera in Wolverhampton. This time, he's got a red woolly hat instead of the stripy one, and fetching white gloves. Again in Wolverhampton, it's now mid-January. Do you know who he is? Two days later, he was back at the Walsall branch. This time, he seemed reckless. The cashier recognised him, and though he ran off, maybe he was desperate. Though he knew he'd been spotted, he still came back. Excuse me, can I have an uh, instant access form, please? Yes. Can I take your name? King. Dave King. All right. You've just got to sign here and be with you within 10 days. No attacks in February. Why not? But in March, he was in King's Heath and was seen pacing back and forth as though plucking up his courage. This is what one of the cashiers thought he looked like. 
about 5 foot 10, between 25 to 35 years old. His last known raid was on the 6th of April. Has he moved elsewhere, or what's he been doing since? And does he have a car? The branches he's raided are quite far apart, and they're all near a motorway junction. He's slim built, pale and drawn, with a big nose and short dark hair, and he has a local accent, 0500 600 600, or 01 902 649 020. That's Wolverhampton, 649 020. A little further north now, who's this? For a man who could be carrying a gun, he's surprisingly polite. He's 40 to 50, heavily built with a beard, and always the same glasses, hat and anorak. Since Christmas 1997, he's raided banks in Mansfield, Chesterfield, Crewe and Derbyshire. He always waits in line. He's confident and quietly spoken. The customer at the next counter doesn't even realise the cashier's being threatened. February 1998, the same glasses, hat and coat, but now he's got a green carrier bag and inside is what seems to be a gun. March 1998, again he waits patiently in line and then implicitly makes threats to kill. Same bank, same camera, 11 months later. The only difference is that this time his carrier bag is blue. Do you know who this is? Mid 40s, fairly short and plump. Could it be your husband or your son? And does he too have a car? It may be coincidence, but after one raid, a rare green Austin Princess Vanden Pla was seen near the bank. The registration number was VPX374K. That's VPX374K. Where's that car now? 0500 600 600 or 01 244 612 999. That's Chester 612 999. Now down to the southwest of England, to a spread of attacks in market towns that seem to centre around Swindon. This was in July 1998, and the man's not just armed. When the cashier treats him as a joke, he pulls the trigger. This time it turned out to be an air gun. His only disguise seems to be a baseball cap, and he clearly has a few favourites. Here he is in Glastonbury. Again, he's waited till the branch is empty before he enters. Nobody's noticed his accent, so presumably he's local. 0500 600 600 or 01793 507 992. That's Swindon 507 992. And here's why he's called the cutout gunman. These silhouettes compiled by the police may look ridiculous, but they seem to be very successful. The gunman's mid 20s to early 30s. He's 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 6. Slim to medium build sometimes with stubble on his chin, with short dark hair which is in a duck's tail at the back. Who does he live with? Which pub does he drink in? Call us if you've any ideas, 0500 600 600. Here are the numbers for all three of these different robbers. 01902 649020, that's for Where's Wally. 01244 612999 for the so-called polite Cheshire Raider and 01793507992 for this, the cutout gunman. And as always, one number's good for all three of these cases, 0500 600 600. Now, just imagine going on holiday, leaving someone to look after your home, and then coming back to find you've been defrauded of pretty much all your savings. It happened to a couple from Brighton who went to Australia over Christmas. Their house sister, sitter befriended this man in a gay club and invited him back to the house. When he disappeared, so did premium bonds, share certificates and checkbooks. Here he is on a shopping spree with their store card. Worse still, on coming home, the couple found their bank accounts had been ransacked and big loans had been taken out in their names. This man is known to have frequented hotels in Brighton and London and has used the names Stephen Williams and Stephen Watkins. He's around 27 years old, 5 foot 7, 5 foot 8 tall, heavy set with short cropped dark hair. He's got distinctive blushing red cheeks and vertical scars on the inside of his knees. He also often wears a silver Gaelic band on his right wrist. Oh, yes, Tell us who and where he is, 0500 600 600, or you can ring the local police on 01273 665 666. That's Brighton, 665 666.
In Hampshire, there's been a new and tragic way of drug dealing. Suppliers who came into the town of Andover and flooded the county with cheap, high-quality heroin. So cheap that lots of people tried it. Then a big network of local dealers built up. Lots of people have been arrested in a swoop called Operation Blackfield. But two men from Merseyside might like to help detectives take this case further. They're Jason Talib, who's 26, 5 foot 7, tubby, of mixed race and with a strong Liverpool accent. And his companion is Philip Lee Wagner. He's 22, over 6 foot and slim. They may be in Liverpool or they could be anywhere. Call and tell us on 0500 600 600 or 01252 626 431. That's Aldershot 626 431. About five weeks ago, a 12-year-old girl got off a bus in London's Whitechapel Road and was walking home from school when she realised a man was following her. As she got to the entrance of a block of flats, he forced his way in and seriously sexually assaulted her. A truly dreadful crime, but maybe you can help stop it happening again. This is the best image we have of her attacker. He's about 18, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8, and he may be Bengali. He was wearing a black knee-length coat, a red and yellow shirt, and beige trousers. Now, DS Brian Bull, you've been looking into this dreadful incident. Yeah. Tell us what happened to him after the attack. Well, we think he made off um, the attacker on foot through the old Spitalfields market area, um, through on foot through that market into Brushfield Street and got into a silver Japanese car. And who in particular are you appealing to tonight? Um, but it was a particularly horrific crime, as you've mentioned. Um, I think that the victim is severely traumatised, as is their, her family. Um, I'm appealing for any persons from the uh, local community, especially the Bengali uh, parts of the community, and if any person has been followed in the past in similar circumstances, I appeal to them as well. I'm looking for anybody that any information concerning the crime itself, um, the, vic uh, the um, suspect, or anybody who knows a person who owns a Japanese car. Well, if you have any ideas on who that man is, particularly in conjunction with a silver car, call 0500 600 600, or you can call the incident room on 0181 217 3837. That's 0181 217 3837, where there's a Bengali translator available if you need one. There are some really strong calls coming in tonight. We'll tell you about them later. In one of the first ever Crime Watch programmes, some, I think it was 14 years ago, we covered a terrible crime in which a man posed as a gas board official and murdered a shopkeeper who'd led him into his kitchen. We now have what may be a somewhat similar crime, this time a man posing as a water company official. It happened in Bethnal Green in East London on a Friday afternoon four weeks ago. The victim was Mary Lazenby. Her family are all keen that this appeal should go ahead, but they're so distressed they couldn't themselves take part. So Mary's carer guides us through what happened. Her life was her cats. She loved her cats. I used to say to her, Mary, have your dinner. And she'd make sure the cat had her dinner first. <laughs> Chico! Chico! I've been going to see Mary on and off for about 10 years. And I used to take her dinner every day. Come on, then. She mainly just stayed in her flat. She might put the telly on sometimes. But she was mainly with her cat. Deep down, you do have your little favourites. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. You know, Mary was one of them. Mary had her own flat at the end of this corridor in Rochester Court, housing for the elderly. It may be sheer coincidence, but a neighbour, Sophie, had an unexpected visitor on Friday afternoon, the 21st of May. He had no right to be in the building, and certainly no right to be inside Sophie's flat. Who are you? Hello there, I'm just from the water board here to see about your water. Do you have a bowl or anything like that I can borrow? There's nothing wrong with my water. I see your identity Yeah, of course, there you go. Okay. Tell you what, should we go and see the warden? She knows me, she'll vouch for me. Good doubt. Okay. Later on, Sophie found her purse was missing. Soon afterwards, two men were seen sitting on a wall in Wilmot Street outside Rochester Court. Who were they? And was this their van? 
Then, half an hour later, the son of some residents answered the intercom. Uh, sorry, I uh, got the wrong flat. Okay. Who was trying to get into the building around 5 p.m. that Friday? Was this you, innocently going to the wrong flat? Or was it the man who'd stolen Sophie's purse? Then, an hour later, at Mary's end of the corridor. As we came out of the lift, we saw a man at Mary Lazenby's door. I assumed he was visiting. He was very casual and he just walked in and out of sight. I've got a lump in my throat. Every time I talk about it, I feel sick. You know? Because she... She would have let anybody in. She would have believed anything anybody would have told her. But to do what they did to her is just unbelievable. Half an hour later, Mary was heard talking to someone in her flat. What are you doing that to me for? Even then, I just thought it was a relative or a visitor of some kind that she knew. She wasn't shouting, she didn't sound frightened. And we can go down. As we went in the lift, I heard Mary's front door open and close quite quickly. Now I think that maybe it was her opening the front door and maybe him shutting it. Maybe she was trying to get out. And I wish I'd gone back up to have a listen outside the door or even from the lift I might have heard something. OK, dear, I'm all done. I'll see you next week, all right? You take care. All right. When I left my clients, I was walking towards Mary's door. A young fella came out of the door. You were going in this flat? Oh, no. He didn't appear nervous at all. He was 17 to 18 years old, medium height, had short blonde hair, a thin face with a chipped tooth, and was smart and clean. Mary's body was discovered in her living room the next morning. She'd been punched and kicked so hard that her jaw, her ribs, and her spine were broken. I just remember the lady I used to go to every single day for years. Warm, lovely, simple lady. And I just, I'll just remember smiling, to me, smiling at me at the door. I mean, whoever killed her seems to have completely lost it, lost control. Yeah, Mary's injuries were absolutely horrendous. Her jaw, her sternum, every rib in her body was broken. Her spine was actually snapped and her heart and her liver both exploded as a result of the force used on her. She was a, a small, frail lady with a disability. She I mean, was, yes. It seems inconceivable that whoever did this could have, could have done this as a first offence. I wouldn't have thought so. I would have thought there was probably a string of minor offences that have led up to this. Uh, did he do this on his own, or do you think there were two people involved, or perhaps more? There was certainly... He was in on the flat, in the flat on his own. I would think that there was a possibility that there was another man outside the flat somewhere, maybe in the street outside, or outside the confines of the flat itself. How seriously in trouble is that accomplice? Well, I can't believe that two people went out that day intent on committing this horrendous crime. I would think that probably one of them doesn't know what his accomplice has done. If he was outside and he went out with a view of committing what he thought was a minor crime, a theft of some description, and now he knows what's actually happened within, if he comes forward and speaks to us, tells us who the other person is, I can assure him I will deal with him for the minor offence of theft providing he's got nothing to do with this offence of murder at all. And if he doesn't come forward, is he in much bigger trouble? Of course he is, yeah, because that just shows that he may have some sort of knowledge, or he may have been part of it. Now, this effort of the, we've got from the witness who saw the man coming out of the flat, you're fairly confident of that. Tell, tell us what you know about this man's description. The effort is very good. The man is about 18 years old, he's 5 foot 10, he's got an angular face, pointed features, quite slim build, He's described as quite good looking with short cropped hair but there's, he's got half a tooth missing on the left hand upper part of his mouth and his smile is actually ruins his good looks apparently because there's a buckle in the rest of his teeth. Now this is terrifying to, to people this sort of attack, particularly to elderly people. You were telling me earlier... Uh, older
shouldn't be worried about this sort of thing. It's very, very rare indeed. It, it is very rare, Nick. Yeah, older people shouldn't be worried at all because statistics show that younger people are more prone to be victims of violent attacks. And as I said before, there's absolutely no need for this sort of violence to be used on this type of person. Well, this is a horrible crime. Though. There, there may be something, anything that you can contribute if there is, please. 0500 600 600, that call costs you nothing. Or you could ring detectives in the incident room on 0171 790 1212. That's 0171 790 1212. This is a man to beware of, especially if you're a sportsman. Not only does he claim to be a professional golfer, but also a police officer and a lottery winner. And he's even claimed to be a sufferer of terminal cancer. He's wanted in connection with several frauds. Have you ever lent him money or given him personal financial details? He's Thomas Mansford Stewart. He's mid-thirties, blue eyes, slim, five foot ten and comes from Kent. If you know anything about him, do please let us know on 0500 600 600 or 01245 212 518. That's Chelmsford 212 518. On Good Friday at the beginning of April, there was a fight outside a pub in Sudbury in Suffolk. As a result, Carl Morris, a young man from Sudbury, died of head injuries. Officers have launched a murder investigation and are anxious to trace Stephen Mackay, who comes from Great Cornard. He's known to have connections in London, Colchester, Colchester and Leamington Spa. You can't miss him. He's 28, tall at 6 foot 3 and well built. If you know where he is, call us here 0500 600 600 or 01284 774 333. That's Barry St Edmunds 774 333. We have some very, very strong calls indeed coming in at the moment. We'll give you some more details of them later on. In April, we reappealed to find the man responsible for four linked rapes on children in East London and Essex over a five-year period. It was a general appeal to eliminate ginger-haired men in the area aged between 20 and 40, medium height and build. Hundreds called in, and police are busy tracing and eliminating those names. Detectives would now like to know who this man is. He may have crucial information about an indecent assault on a 14-year-old girl on a Central Line tube train between Barkingside and Newbury Park. This is him on Sunday the 30th of May at Leytonstone Station. Who is he? 5 foot 10, around 30, medium build with short cropped ginger hair. Call the British Transport Police Direct on 0171 387 0354. That's 0171 387 0354. Or here at the studio, as always, 0500 600 600. We will be taking calls till midnight, and there are other numbers on CFAX page 621. You can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. And on any case, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously if you prefer 0800. Travel 5, Travel 1. If you've been a victim, you want to talk to someone at Victim Support Line, there are people there till 2 a.m. and the number's 0845 30 30 900. Join us for Crime Watch Update at 11.45 in half an hour's time, and if you can't stay up, well, next month's Crime Watch, take a note of it, Tuesday, July the 13th. And with all the help coming in tonight, incidentally, crime now down 15% in the last five years, too. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night.